All right, from the studio in Fairfax City, we are very grateful that Denise Bent accepted our invitation that we shown. Denise, welcome to my humble podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Claudio. I'm very happy to be here. I'm here. Uh, same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to the beginning. How do you start in music and how to, to begin with, you know? Well, I was very fortunate to grow up in Los Angeles. So we had the music industry near here and uh, the school system where I grew up in Compton uh, had a wonderful music program and, and youth symphony orchestra that my brothers and I were in. And, uh, and then we were also in the Screen Children's Guild because you could do that, um, you know, putting children to work uh, in the movie industry. Um, so that was really good too. And also I had a very musical family. They weren't necessarily professional, my immediate family, but, uh, but we all sang and played, you know, piano or gu guitar or, and every gathering we all sang songs and we still do. So, uh, you know, that, and I just was always passionate about music and records. And I had older brothers and sisters with great record collections, like, you know, with Elvis and, and the coasters and, um, you know, uh, just so many different people that I got to listen to their records and, and the radio, big radio fan as a kid and always was breaking down the elements of the songs in my head. Um, certain little, you know, riffs somebody would do or, or the way they would sing something, you know, would just, to me, that, that was the one little thing that made that record, you know, fantastic. And that's always how it worked. And I'm very passionate about music. And, and so, uh, and I had a boyfriend who had a band when we were in high school and um, his guitar player ended up working uh, as an engineer for Leon Russell and invited me to Leon's house, which had a, um, you know, he had a home studio, which nobody had back then because it was very expensive, took up a lot of real estate. And usually studios, record companies paid for. Well, Leon had his own record company. And, um, uh, but anyway, I was a huge fan of Leon. So uh, after school that day when I was invited, I went over and uh, Leon answered his door and I almost fainted. And, and uh, But I heard all this music coming out of what was supposed to be a dining room. And that's a control room now. And I looked in and there was a console and there was uh, a 40 track tape machine and there was outboard gear and there was just beautiful music happening that was like the angels were singing and i'd been studying film uh i was in film school already but boy when i heard that i just knew that that's what i was supposed to do it was my epiphany and um the next day i dropped out of university and found a recording school and signed up and told my parents but I what they say about it well fortunately being the youngest of six kids, um, my dad, who was a dean of Northrop University, which was an aerospace school, uh, teaching a, you know, a very similar cert a certified um, a career, you know, uh, was, uh, so it's like working on airplanes and jets and things, how to be mechanics for that. Um, so he understood the importance of a, a, a technical school um, and that university wasn't necessarily for everybody at that time. And so I had his blessing and shocked the heck out of me. I didn't, I didn't expect that, but I was going to go forward anyway. So um, fortunately that happened. Uh, and it was very hard to find a recording school back then. There were just like none and um, not like today. And so uh, I would go to school Monday and Wednesday nights and it was mostly lecture and I wouldn't understand what they were talking about. You know, what's the Doppler effect in Ohm's law and, and velocity and amplitude and, and what's compression and what's limiting and um, what's equalization and what's phasing. And, you know, they would talk, but it wouldn't really demonstrate it. And 
it was like Chinese to me. So fortunately, Roger, who was Leon's engineer and my friend, would let me come over and he would let me play with stuff and he would explain it to me and I could act, actually practice. And as classes went on and I got more hands on, I could always go on Tuesdays and Thursdays when I used to be in university. Now I was free to Leon's house and practice in the morning what I'd learned. And um, then around two o'clock in the afternoon or so they would go to work. But um, uh, also I had an excellent instructor in Roger because he was um, 18 and working on his little invention is what he called it. And it was the Lynn drum. It was Roger Lynn. So uh, yeah. So he kn knew his stuff and, and, um, it was just a really wonderful opportunity for me. I guess the, I had the full support of the universe to not only go to school, but to have that as well to really get hands-on learning. So when I graduated from school, I was pretty comfortable around, you know, recording artists and in the studio. And, you know, that was just... Uh, the palette that I paint with and, and the instrument that I play. And that's how comfortable I felt with it. You know, I'm, I see myself as a recording artist. As Absolutely. Man. Yeah, it's an so art. It is an art. It is an it's art. It's no and, way around. It's, uh, yeah. Know. Yes. It's technical. However, to me, my, I feel it's like driving a Ferrari or driving any car. Um, once you know how to drive it, you have to know where you want to go with it. And just knowing how to drive a car doesn't mean anything unless you know where you want to go. And, and that's the vehicle that gets you to where you want to go. So you have the vision or you work with the artists and their vision. And, um, and these are all tools or these are, like I said, you know, this is my instrument that I play on this record. And, um, so that's how I've always felt. And so actually I'm not, I'm not terribly technical. And in my recording school, um, they did not teach any, um, maintenance or, you know, there wasn't any soldering and electronics and all of that because back then studios, uh, had tech departments. And they did not want anybody else fixing anything or attempting to fix anything except the people in the tech department. So they would know how it was fixed, who fixed it, how well it was fixed. My job was just to use the equipment. So if something broke, Rich. if a microphone was breaking up, if headphones were not working or somebody, you know, something was wrong with the console, you just said maintenance and you stepped aside. And... They came in and they dealt with it because they were the best people to deal with it. Um, but as a result, as things have evolved, um, you know, it's, uh, and people have home studios and, and um, uh, uh, recording studios don't have quite the, um, uh, you know, budgets or, or whatever. Having an in-house tech is, and a tech department is absolutely luxurious, you know, and that, that's only in the finest sound palaces, um, the, the few that are left, relatively speaking. But it, when I started out, that was just part of every studio. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, Los Angeles, there are many, you know, the village where you work at at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot of money, a lot of budget. You know, it was very expensive to set up. Mm -hmm. uh, a studio nowadays with a 2,000 computers. You know, not everybody, but it's possible to do it at home without hiring, you know, someone like yourself or or going to a studio and paying, I don't know, 400 bucks an hour or 2,000 a day, whatever, whatever the number happened to be. How how did studios, like the studios in, in Los Angeles, for example, are able to still break even or be prof profitable? Well, without a lot of them... Money? A lot of them are owned by people uh, who are not in the music business, who are wealthy from another reason. For example, um, the village 
was uh, built by a gentleman named Jordy Hormel, who yeah. came from the Hormel dynasty with, you know, spam, ham, and chili. And, um, wow. and it was for him to be able to record in. And uh, then it got so popular, he had to um, build his own studio at his house because he couldn't get into his own studio to record. Um, and um, many of the big studios are either owned by corporations, you know, EMI or Sony or Universal or um, um, East West is owned by um, Doug Rogers, who made all his money on the uh, sound libraries the East West Sound Library. So uh, buying a studio to do them in, um, that's, you know, his money came from someplace else. And, and so often that's the case. There are some fabulous studios that are owned by people who, you know, can't perform music or uh, sing their way out of, out of a paper bag, but that they are passionate about music and want to participate somehow. And they, they can provide that um, recording studio in that environment. Well, I think a Mr. Greenberg, I think, owns the Yeah, Jeff Village Greenberg now. owns it now. Yes, yeah, but, and he also yeah. has his own money. And um, uh, thank God, because he has just turned the village, uh, expanded and taken over this whole beautiful uh, historical masonic temple building and yeah. has just it's truly a sound palace it is gorgeous it has many rooms in it of all different sizes depending on if it's for uh you know an artist to write in or to uh, to have big auditorium to do presentations and performances and um you know if the the lighting in this auditorium Jeff bought at uh, the MGM auction and it was the lights were the same ones that were in Gone with the Wind hanging from the ceilings of the uh, plantation house yeah. and that's what's in the village now you know, man, I, I need to go and visit you there man I yes, need to go should. and visit you there and, Let and me go take and you hang on a out tour. with you and, and introduce me to all these great people and so they're it's still the village is still busy nowadays. I mean, it's still a lot of recording. It's, or... it's confusing to me hours, because, right? um, yes, a lot of them are. Sometimes they're just writing sessions. Sometimes they're um, re recording. And one thing that has uh, come up for me more than once is that uh, people want to record what they call raw, um, a, a band playing together in the same room. Uh, and capturing the performance, um, and often they want to do it to tape, analog tape. So yes. um, I know how to do that, and I like doing it. There are a lot of yeah. engineers, you know, younger engineers or older or anybody who um, don't know how to do it or don't want to know how to do it, or they do know how to do it and they don't like it. They don't want to do it. So mm -hmm. I like it. Uh, I like the commitment. I like the you know to me it's it's very creative it's very hands-on um it's not just typing on a keyboard and looking at a screen and making everything perfect and one person comes in and you know you you take drum samples and you make beats and then you have the beats and then somebody comes in and does bass or and then you fix the bass to make it perfect instead of have a groove or you know um to me that's that's great for somebody else, but that's not what makes me happy recording music. I like to inspire and capture a performance. I like to get goosebumps and tears in my eyes because something just unbelievably wonderful just happened out there and in the studio. And, and that's what makes me happy. And that's what makes me want to do what I want to do. And I can do that with Pro Tools, but I record as if I'm recording the tape, pretty much, because I'm 
I don't want to labor over anything. I don't want 70 takes of anything. I'm, I want that energy and that excitement and that passion to be captured. And um, I totally appreciate the conveniences of, you know, um, digital audio workstations and how you can move things around and make them in perfect sync and make, you know, you can, I suppose you can auto tune them, but if somebody's performing on an instrument or they're singing or something, I would much rather, instead of try to fix what they did, just say, Oh, that was so good. There's just one line that's, you know, can we just pick this up a little bit? You were a little pitchy. I'll roll back and, you know, you sing, I'll play, you know, and, um, and uh, they sing along and I punch them in, I punch them out just like I'm recording the tape and, and, um, and then it's there, but it's their performance. I'm not manipulating it electronically or digitally. And, you know, that's, I'm old school too. I'm, I've earned that. <laughs> You're a tape, tape girl, if we can say that. Make sure to open a website, the tape girl that, that comes. <laughs> you you mentioned you mentioned um the lean drum. You know, I was looking up and um I think the guys end up selling like a ten thousand unit and uh trip it was used by Trevor Horn, Herbie Hancock, the print, the human league and amazing man. I, I always look back in the old albums be yeah. way before I, I, I was buying music and I didn't know how it was put together like a good example would be in, yeah the human league is a good example yeah Trouble well forward. it was kind of the propaganda the sound, on social board, sound, you know sound of the late 80s or you know yeah. um it had its its own characteristic and it you know was a shift in recording it was the first time that um you know you didn't have to have a real drummer even though a yeah. real drummer made the tones that's um, right yeah and and sampled were the samples. Uh, also, I worked with Roger Nichols, who created Wendell, which was yeah. also a drum sampling computer. Yeah. So, yeah, I think he passed away, right, Roy Nichols? Yes, Nichols? he did. He was a very good man, well well known, and he was people really amazing. liked the guy in the industry, you know? Yeah, I yes. read that. He was brilliant, yet uh, he was such a communicator and was so enthusiastic about whatever he was interested in. It was really important for him to make sure that what he was talking about, um, the person he was telling it to or the class or whatever, they understood. He wanted them to know what it was about, where so often you find really smart people who like to let you know how smart they are all the time and sure, sure. uh yeah and and will explain things in in ways that they don't really care whether you understand what they're talking about or not and sometimes that was an issue for me if something was wrong something was had gone down in the studio and i was in a particular studio and there were these few texts here and there no names um and i would say i need show me how to do this right now. This is what's going on. I need to work around it. Tell me what to do. And they go, well, blah, 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 blah. And I go, no, stop, stop. I already know how smart you are. I don't need to know that. I need to know. Just show me what I need to do to get back on track with this session right now. Uh -huh. And um, uh, communicate to me. And, you know. Some people are willing to do that. Some people, they don't care, right? No. So, well, the lot of, you, you know, That's life, right? In every, in every profession, not just in yeah. your profession, but. No, uh, you know, there's, um, I've done a lot of post-production audio as well. And, um, where sound effects and sound design and, and Foley, which is organic sound effects, you know, recording a Foley artist. And, um, there's this, you know, a lot of people who may not have great social skills, but they are perfect to sit in a room by themselves in the dark and make noise. And, you know, um, that yeah. that you know just shoot me i i couldn't i wouldn't want to do that and i've tried doing that and then, um recording fully and working fully artist is about as close to making music as you can besides making music it's re, you know capturing inspiring capturing a performance and sec and sound That's so right. That's, my my understanding you have a famous relative i know you're humble 
You don't like to talk to brag that much, but it's important well, to name a, a Wilson. <laughs> You're... Yeah, well, I, the last one living, yeah, Brian Wilson is, uh, he's like, my, my mom and his dad were, were cousins, first cousins, yeah. and yeah. Um, from Hutchinson, Kansas. Uh, I think his dad was born here, but um, my mother's from Kansas, and and Brian's grandparents and all are from Kansas, and so uh, they're all related back there, the Wilsons. And um, but I don't know Brian. I've met him a few times. I knew Dennis and I knew mm -hmm. Carl, and mm -hmm. um, just but I didn't know them until I was in the recording industry because. Um, well, the Wilson family um, didn't really get along well with Murray when they were little kids in Kansas, or or when they were little. So when they would, they a lot of them moved out to California, um, and the Murray Wilson family was here, and uh, we'd have Wilson family picnics, and they weren't invited. And so I had no idea the Beach Boys were my cousins. You know, they're not you know first cousins, but we're related. Yeah. And um, until uh, I was back in Kansas at my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary and the older people were talking about their concern that um, Dennis Wilson was hanging around with Charlie Manson. And I'm 13 and I'm, you know, how 13-year-olds are. And I said, well, what do you care about that for? And they said, well, because he's your cousin. And... I just about fell over because um, yeah. I wow. did not know that until that time. And I was a huge Beach Boys fan and knew all Amazing. their songs and their yeah. harmonies. And, and my mother and my aunt had, you know, used to sing on the radio on occasion and, and uh, some Wilson sisters and back in the fifties and um, beautiful voices. And, uh, you know, it just, that's, but I grew up with, but I love the Beach Boys, and well, I just kind of flipped out when I found out they were related well, uh, to me. Yeah. Good. Yeah, nobody can say that uh, you are where you are because your family members help you out to get started. So true. I know you. No. You you no. You, you, you began from the bottom bottom. So let me yeah. let me ask you a sort of uh, I don't know personal question, but how difficult was you? You know you. You know, we the music industry is a male-dominated field, and a lot of rich mm -hmm. people had, you know, studios, and very few were willing to give uh, a lady like yourself, a girl, an opportunity. And uh, at the time, you know, because my mom is an engineer, and I grew up with. Oh, she is. You know, okay. So yeah, she... I, I believe I, you know, my I know the answer, but in my case, I, I was raised by. Seven women in my life, so um, I, I, I know exactly where you came from because my my, my sister showed me the world. You know, you need to help mm -hmm. at home. You know, the the bed, nobody will make the bed for you. You need to learn how to cook, fix this, fix, fix. and all those skills killed me out when I came to the United States, right? So to to study on those words. So in your case, you know, you you were hanging out with Leon, you were learning a lot, you graduated, and then, well, start for me to start begin looking for a job. I imagine that you were all a girl, it was hard to get into a, a studio and get a, an assistant job, I imagine, right? Well, apparently, again, you know, the, the universe supported me, or for some reason I was supposed to do this because uh, yeah. I was, when I went to recording school, that first night, there were about 50 guys and me the only girl in the class and um but i didn't care i had brothers uh, my dad you know i was always around my brothers and his friends and i was very comfortable around guys and yeah. um and i guess i was a bit of a tomboy but um my interests were you know i loved to build things and take things apart and put them back together and and um uh and i did it was just my mindset and um, it never occurred to me once I found out how records were made when I walked into Leon's house that night and it never occurred to me that that's not something anybody couldn't do who wanted to do it. 
And then it was, to- and I still feel that way. It's totally genderless. If you want to do that, do it because it has nothing to do with gender, color, um, sexual orientation, whatever, nothing. It has to do, it's just like saying, oh, I want to drive a car, you know, so drive a car. The car doesn't and, care who you are, right? It, no, it, right. it doesn't. And, um, and that's how, I, so it didn't occur to me that women didn't do it. I knew that there would be challenges because that's always, that's an awareness women have. Um, uh, but I was lucky because um, once I, when I was comfortable around guys, so I, they didn't intimidate me. And um, that's something I've realized is an issue later on in life when, with younger women. You know, not a lot of people, not a lot of women had good relationships with uh, siblings or, or boys growing up or men or their fathers or mm. uncles or stepfathers. Or, you know, there's a, a lot of stuff that I did not have. I had uh, a very supportive, strict father. But, um, you know, I did not have any bad things with men in my life, in my family or whatever. So I was very comfortable around guys. And um, also, when I graduated, I applied at two studios. One was Wally Hyder's, which is no longer around. And that was in Hollywood. And the other one was The Village because I like the location or there it's just something about it seemed right to me. And the person who was hiring assistant engineers, Gary Starr, uh, who is in charge of the maintenance people and then the assistants and all, uh, hired four women out of the six assistants, four of them were women. And that was uh, actually Jordy Hormel's idea. He thought women would, really add something to the studio. I don't think it was a, it, it never occurred to me that it was a sexist thing, um, but maybe it was, you know, but um, I didn't see it like that. I saw it as um, an opportunity. And also I did not know other studios weren't hiring women. I didn't, again, I did not know women didn't do it or anybody who didn't, anybody who wanted to do it there would be a challenge unless you're a straight white guy. And um, uh, so, and there was already one woman already there. And then I was hired the same day. I was hired another female engineer, Barbara Isaac. Uh, She and I started together and Terry Becker, who was already there was started mentoring us and showing us how to, you know, correctly, wrap my cables and we just got right into it. And um, then a few months later, another woman, Carla Frederick was hired and we all went on to be uh, professionals either in post-production or continue to make records or um, yeah, both. Um, Sadly, I'm the only one who's still living. Um, Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, They all, the, the, Three of them died of cancer. I had cancer first, but I got over it. Um, but they later died, each one that way. And so it was very sad because we remained friends all our lives. And there weren't that many, there were very few women back then. And mm-hmm. so um, we really had each other's back. And, and um, you know, if, an, if a group or an artist was coming into the studio that we any one of us wanted to assist on, um, we knew that uh, our friendship and support of each other was more important than, you know, if somebody got, for whoever a particular got it, we were happy for that person. And sure. uh, because yeah. not everybody could work on everything. So, you know, but we all had our uh, different styles and, and the studio manager would assign us to, um, you know, an appropriate uh, session that we would be best for each one. Yeah, and- gotcha, gotcha. But you know that we're talking about the seventies, right? Computers were not around, of course. Cell phone, 
Mm-mm. Internet didn't exist. Uh, nowadays is in a console you can capture notes and uh, you know different characteristics associated with a particular mix. Back in the day, you guys were taking notes, right? Looking at the board, the equalizer, so you can why there was a great section. Well, we did you this. Here's the page. Here's the second page. Here's the third page, and and the tape, yeah. you know, and so the word and. Uh, that was a very important, very important part of being an assistant engineer yeah. uh, for uh, each song because you had um, you had the the reel of tape. Yeah, you know, you record the tapes and then you would make what's called a master reel, where so ever all the the songs that uh, you agreed to that were going to be the masters for each song, um, those recordings were all put together onto one real like you know like a record and um and for each song there was uh you had notes for you know uh how it was set up or what got that tone or whatever because if for some reason a few months down the line they needed to replace something or fix something or whatever um you had it in your notes how that Bass was bass. What was the bass amp, and what was the microphone on the bass amp, and what was gu- the bass guitar, and who was the bass player? Or you know, that's just an example. But all of that was in your notes, and how it came up if it was compressed using an eleven seventy six or an LA two A. Um, these are um, you know um, compressors and limiters, and what was the equalization, and um, you know you can get real down into a rabbit hole regarding it um Amazing. so they could recall it now that's right you know it's it, it's all safe yeah and, uh, man I, I wish i had known you at the time i would have you know i would be around you hanging out with you it's fun. You for coffee we be, all uh, had a lot of fun right? huh? oh yeah i i see i like i told you before right so i i knew when i was a little when I was little, that music will be an important in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I knew that I'm very shy, believe it or not. I'm, I'm calling, talking to people over the world, but I'm very shy. And I knew I, I, I didn't have the skill to be a musician. I, I never learned how to play an instrument or take a note. So my thing was I was listening and buying a lot of music. So I, I kind of, you know, develop on, I don't know, uh, I was music. Music enthusiasts. Enthusiasm. Well, you were, you were, and, the and then, and, and then I have a, a good, and, and then I have a good eye for the stuff. So, but, but I did until that five years ago, I didn't know in which sense music would become important until I, during the pandemic, when I opened the radios, I opened another one, they sent the link to a friend, they like it. A couple of companies reach out to me if I can put a, a list of, you know, top. 2000 mm-hmm. trucks and stuff. And then I began calling people during the pandemic because nobody was touring. So I thought musician must be bored at home. I better start calling people. And I got lucky by accident, believe it or not. It's, you know, and I mm-hmm. kind of perf- perfected the, you know, the, the skill set. And remember, I was very nervous at the beginning. I didn't know what to ask. Remember the first interview with, with Steve Hackett from Genesis. And I remember I oh, talking okay. to the guy. Say, Steve, I want to do something different. My, I'm not doing this for the money. I I want to capture this for the future generation and have an interest in music. I, I showed him, have, I don't know, at the time, I had like a 7,000 buying on a Blu-ray. And I say, I know you're missing from Genesis. I know this. And, then, and the guy told me, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. And then the second, the third, the fifth, the 50, the 100, and now I have done like a 750. So I, it, wow. it's, uh, it's unbelievable for me to... Talk to people like yourself that were in the trenches, you know. I, I and uh, you were there, you know. I, yeah. I, you know. So um, it's it's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about um, Steely Dan, you know, and the album. Of course, you work in Asia. Mm-hmm. You know, I always wonder. I want to show you something. It's hard to yeah. see, but see. Oh yeah, yeah. You have two right there, right? Well, this this one's from Asia. And the other is Blondie? And that Blondie, yeah. My God, man. 
If you pass and away I, one day, can you will it to me? Uh, you, no, I, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but I was I was the assistant on this. No, I know but that one. I was the the only engineer. You know, yeah. and um, that's you know I I always because, look back. Of course, I own all the still down record, and I always wonder how in the world were done the way they were done and why they sound so great and it's always funny you can ask anybody you can go to any concert you know pink floyd let's seven and janet oh. peter gave you mentioned still Dan, and 100 percent with man great record you know you know they were walter you know and, and the only two to remember there uh, but uh it sounds great why well, what why do you think uh, they they sound the way well, because the attention to the sound quality and what they were hearing in their head was very specific, and they were um, uh, together. The two of them just had this amazing sound. Actually, um, Walter was I think the first lead singer and he had a beautiful voice. He had the yeah. he had some solo records and it was, his was a little more soulful, but that Donald became the um the voice of Steely Dan and that was frustrating for him because he didn't like his voice. And yet he couldn't get anybody to sound the way he wanted it to sound, even though they tried on that one record, they had David Palmer, you know, sing on Dirty Work, and they had a band, and and it just then, you know, wasn't anything wrong with David. It was um, that was Donald's voice was that voice of those songs, and that just was the way it had to be, whether he liked it or not. Um, and uh, Roger Nichols, there were um, on the Asia album, there were. Four engineers. Yeah. Uh, there was um, uh, Al Schmidt and Elliot Shiner and Bill Schnee and Roger Nichols. And um, I worked on the record most of 10 and a half months. We did that at the village. And Roger Nichols was my main mentor. And he taught me so much of what the minutiae was about, the cleanest signal using the shortest mic cables, uh, not letting mic cables touch, um, just all the things that so many people say, and nobody's going to hear that. Well, just from a technical recording point of view, he kept a very clean signal flow, as it's called, from the microphone through the console to the tape machine. And... He had been um, a nuclear physicist at San Onofre Power Plant down by San Diego here in California. And um, he started making records, he said, because he didn't like uh, all the mistakes and the noises that he heard on records. He wanted to make clean sounding records. And also he went to high school and one of his pals was Frank Zappa. They went to the same high school and they would hang out in the, um, you know, after school. And I uh, just can't imagine that because uh, that to me, they're so very different, but actually they weren't. I got to work on a couple Frank Zappa records too. So, um, but uh, um, Roger was, you know, a very straight, but funny, uh, but brilliant engineer and did not complicate things and so the sound was very clean and also donald and walter would just keep doing things until they got it he said i don't want it perfect i just want it right well you know that's that can be harder than perfect and uh so it took a long time and it um drove a lot of people crazy a lot of artists who were used to you know 
just playing th things through all the way and they would do the overdubs, meaning, you know, after you got the basic tracks in the studio, the drums, bass, guitar, maybe rhythm guitar, keyboard, a work vocal, or you tried to get as much as you could, but as long as the drums were right, they could replace everything else. And they pretty much did. It wasn't very often that they kept too many things that happened on those basic recording sessions. So they would replace things, uh, including the bass and including the keyboards. And they would add, you know, um, horn sections. They would add uh, background vocalists. They would have harmonies. They would add percussion. They would add synthesizers. And so those are all called overdubs. And um, so it took a long time as they built each one of these songs. And they would just do a section at a time quite often or a few notes at a time and then stop and listen back. And it had to do with, you know, intonation, phrasing, um, quality of performance, all these things. And so the nothing came very quickly or fast or spontaneously um, except some of the solos and uh, like the saxophone solo in a song called Deacon Blues, um, that happened pretty quickly, but also they made him do lots of solos before they accepted one. And then they would put it on a variety of tracks. And this is to tape, you know, this is not to a digital workstation where you can move things around easily and cut and paste and all of that. This was to tape. So you had to mute and, you know, it was much more difficult process, but they would do what's called comping the solo where they would like this part of um, this take and this part of this take and this take. So they would often construct the solo from different takes with bits that they liked. Is that making yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's what happened with the um um the sax solo on the song Asia. Um, um the Wayne Shorter from Weather Report. Uh they were working in town and Donald wanted him to do the solo on Asia, and so he got his phone number from the studio manager Dick LaPalm at the village and and left him a message and, and Wayne never returned his call and Di Donald was kind of devastated. And um, so uh, he told Dick and, and Dick called Wayne and Wayne said he didn't know who Donald was, so he didn't return his call. And uh, and so Dick LaPalm said, um, Wayne, I think you really want to, you want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you you really should do this. And yeah. uh, so Wayne goes, okay. So um, they were working on one of their records. I don't know if it was heavy weather or black market or what across town. So we <laughs> had to have him in the morning because his session started at noon and he couldn't not be there working on somebody else's record. So, um, so he came in in the morning and uh, meditated for a bit and then, went into the studio and did six passes in about half an hour and then left. And um, Roger and Gary Katz, the producer, and Donald and, and Walter decided what bits they liked and they created that solo that's there and all the different parts that he did. And um, typically there would be a solo that... Um, was almost perfect or had all you know most of the elements that they liked the most so they just had to fix a little bit here or a little bit there and that's people do that all the time but um they did it a lot two few questions right there why four engineers and then why are you because recording? they weren't all at the same time because oh. uh, they cut some of the tracks in new york and oh, so yeah. um at A&R Studios and uh, I don't know 
what the other studios were and uh, right off. But I know definitely A and R, and so I think Elliot cut some of those, and then they came out here and to producers. Was it producers workshop? It was. What well, was? Um, it was ABC. They were on um, ABC Records, um, and so uh, Bill Schnee recut cut some of the tracks too in that studio. I don't think it's called Amigo. You know, I'm sorry, my brain. I should. Okay. It's terrible. Yeah. It's on. It's on the record. You can. Yeah. You can see it on the credit. Um, yeah. And then they, when it came to the village, some of so uh, Roger was here in California, and so they were going to start peeling back the the takes and or even replacing some of the takes. Um, this is something I I learned uh, also that I wasn't aware of that um, you know some of the tracks that they had cut in New York well. Maybe Bill Schnee re-recorded them at his studio, and and then maybe we redid them at the Village. And um, but I wasn't aware which ones were the ones that were redone or whatever, because as I mentioned before, they would take the master takes that they said, yeah, that's the one that we're going to add these things to, and then eventually mix and master. Um, they create at that master recording reel so they could go from song to song. And it, and it was usually two, two inch reels because that was, um, there are seven songs on the Asia album. And so that took up two reels at 30 inches per second. And um, so I didn't know which ones came from which studio. Once it was compiled, Onto these reels, I didn't know which ones had been recorded yeah, in New York yeah. which, because you slapped a brand new label on there, and there wasn't. And so um, I don't know what was recorded where, except what the ones that we did. And um, later, I heard from Bill Schnee or from Elliot or from Al that said, "Well, I cut that song," and I went, uh, "Well." We did Don't you know that? <laughs> that was before it came to me. Yeah, to yeah. So, um, and as and that happened with the mixes too. Um, turns out, some of the mixes, different people thought they did, and they didn't because they they get pay uh, they get pay accordingly. I imagine, right? It's not a, if you if you okay, the the age of record seven track, right? If you're the engineer for three. And mm -hmm. that person is the engineer for one. Of course, the, the pay is, is, is different. Well, imagine, you right? get paid for what you do. And yeah. I, I don't yeah, But how you identify what you, do, what you did, if when they came to you, they were labeled, and there's a fresh stack, this a box came to the lead, the, the knees of the studio, I put them in and labeled September 1st, you know, 1979, or whatever they happen to be, and then had to. Right, you understand. Hard to go back. Yeah, to that, you know what? That's that went away because um, yeah. that uh, that sh in retrospect, that would have been really nice to know which ones were done where. And actually, one of the best ways to tell which ones were done where by who who was the drummer. And um, because uh, if Steve Gadd was the drummer, it was in New York. Um, Ted Green was the drummer, or yeah, um, I, or Ricky Murata. If Ricky Murata was the drummer, it was here. Yeah. And so, um, uh, Bernard and Purdue and Ed Ber Green Bernard and Purdy. Bernard Purdy was here. Purdy and Paul Cambry. Yeah, this is the list of the forty people that participated in the record. I, I looked it up mm -hmm. on the oh, internet. Good. How in the world? I don't know. It's a simple question. So, so Black Cow and the Asia and then Deacon Blues. Mm -hmm. uh, and then home and last and so forth. Yeah, so central. I, and I know, of course, you know, Donald and Walter World, you know, the, the two main persons from mm -hmm. um, that particular group. So why now I think you now you answer my question. So because 
different people at the time. Some of the some of the early recording were done in New York, so some of the drummers were there, right? And and supposed to there. Yeah. So by one in the world, they have forty different musicians playing an album. That it's it, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to understand, and I'm not going to use any name because I I know some of it. Why Johnny is better than Peter for that track, and Peter is is better than Michael. That track, and Michael is better than Johnny in that track. Why that the, they wanted to work with those people, and this was their opportunity. They they wanted to um, have Tom Scott. Do the horns. They wanted to have um, Timothy B. Schmidt singing background vocals. Um, they wanted um, Michael McDonald yeah. to do background vocals. They, you know, yeah. every one of those people that they brought in, and then all the horn players. You know, those are some of the best horn players. Um, Tom Scott being incredible, and yeah. he wrote the charts, and and then. It was like the A-list of um, of horn players. There was a, a TV show called the Johnny Carson Show, yeah. and it was very popular. And most, a lot of those guys were in his the Johnny Carson Orchestra. So Ooh. they would they would I play, and they they were great. And um, so each song was an opportunity if they heard something or they wanted. Um, you know, they wanted Wayne Shorter to do the solo. They they could because it wasn't a band. Uh, it was just them. So they That's could right. bring yeah. in whoever they wanted on any song, and they got to work with their idols. The, the best of the best. And the record label was saying, hey, no problem. Here's a million dollar or whatever. It would oh, take a year. Well, hey, no problem. What? Well, there was. There was I'm, a because I'm an engineer. I'm efficient, right? I need to look at now. Mm -hmm. I'm a number, right? right? I say, yeah. well. 40 people, that's 40 months. People are from different parts of the country, you know, arrange it and it's no one evening or the hotel or the fee. It's many it nights, many takes. It's very expensive to put it, the It was very expensive. Of course, that yeah. answered my question. That's what the great the album well, is great. But Yeah, th there was a, it, they did um, go over the deadline and they certainly went over their budget. And yeah. one day, we came in and uh, Walter was already in the control room and there were about eight people from the record company uh, in the control room. And so I just turned around and left <laughs> and they were in there with Donald and Walter and Gary Katz for about a um, uh, couple hours. Going through you didn't want to be there. <laughs> well, say, I I was, I, uh, what, what had happened was we were waiting for Walter to show up, and there was Roger and and Donald and Gary Katz and myself. And so we thought, well, we'll go over to the high school a couple blocks away and shoot some baskets. And uh, while we're waiting, and um, it was such a strange combination of people sh shooting baskets. Donald, you know being like this and, and uh, you know, it was just a funny foursome of people shooting baskets just to do something and waiting for Walter. And, and so uh, Donald, as we walked back, Donald was bouncing the ball all the way in the, the basketball and then bounced it down the hallway in the studio way. And as soon as we opened the door and saw all those people, he spun around, threw the ball at me. I caught it, and we, you know, and that was that. And uh, and then a very silly thing happened because of that. Um, what the record company wanted to do, they said, "Well, you're over budget, and this we're we, we're going to take the tapes and have somebody else mix it, and it's done. You're done. You've done everything you're going to do on these, and we're taking them, and that's it." And somehow they didn't take him that day. But um, so after they all left, I got called into the studio and they said, we need you to do something. 
I can tell the story now because nobody's going to fire me and everything worked out. Sue you or something. Yeah, or sue me or, yeah, nothing like that. But they said, um, we need you to take these tapes home, tapes home with you every night and then bring them back the next day. This is the master's tape, the Asia album, that I was to take in the trunk of my little Toyota Corolla um, with speakers for, you know, that have magnets in them. Um, you know, potentially altering the quality of them. And um, so if the record company came to get them, the, they wouldn't be there and they couldn't do it. And nobody was to know about it. And my roommate at the time was actually one of the controllers and, and you know, people in the front desk and, booking people and all of that. And uh, she didn't know anything about it. And um, the stupid thing is, if the record company had ever come for them, who's the first person they'd ask where the tapes? You, of course. That we'll and- go to, We'll go to your house. <laughs> okay, so that's grand theft. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I could get thrown in jail. Um, I doubt the band would have supported me. Uh, I would have been fired for sure because you always have to remember who signs your paycheck and it wasn't Steely Dan. It That's was right. the village. It was the That's village. Cool. And I, I, when I teach workshops or when I taught you know, studio protocols and procedures, um, that's one of the biggest things I impress upon anybody who's working for a studio and as an assistant with the band says never forget who signs your check and it's not the band so don't you know don't say well if we give you a hundred bucks can we work another hour and you know you'll just not write it on the work order or something like that you know um uh, you say well no um if you want to work on it a little longer. Let me let me call them and and make sure. I'm sure it's okay, but let me clear it with with them. You know, that's what you do. You yeah. don't say, "Well, okay, I hundred bucks. Sure, I won't tell anybody." Well, you, people will find out, and you yeah, get fired. Job, but... Yeah, you get fired because of that very reason. You were not loyal to the studio. So so anyway, so stupid me you know, all wrapped up into the drama of this thing. And also I got such a kick out of knowing that I was doing something nobody else knew was going on. And uh, I don't know. It was, you know, I'm, I'm 24, I guess, My God, by man. then. And uh, so thank God nothing. I didn't get rear-ended. My car didn't get stolen. Um Nothing happened and it all worked out and nobody knew. And I've not talked about that ever until like last year. It was the first time I talked about it. My God. <laughs> wow. Because you you wanted to mix it. You say, no, 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 this this is my baby. Nobody's taking the you know, everything they have done to going back to their Well, I was the assistant. I was yeah, I was oh, just whatever, a, but yeah, but I well, no, they didn't they just didn't want some anybody else to mix it or they have, you know. Yeah, they or they, or they yeah. you so, know, that particular record label wanted, no, 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 this, this yeah. record needs to be fit here. We want to put our name on it. We have done 90% of the work. We, we yeah, have the they were the best people to mix it. Anywhere. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, I exactly. Yeah, because no, when you're, um, if a record like that, while you're recording it, you're actually pre-mixing you know your uh every rough mix you do to, to send home to listen to what you recorded that night or whatever is a practice mix for when you're actually going to do it you know and yeah. um so um i always prefer to mix the music to record the music and be the mixer as well and so often now that's not the case you know and people say well um, so you engineered that and they said, who, well, who mixed it? And I said, uh, I, I mixed it. 
I engineered it and mixed it because I'm already thinking about mixing and mastering when I'm first recording, you know.